panelist. I, I enjoyed the remarks very much, and uh, I always uh, I, I learned a lot. A couple of points that I would make, and I would direct them to the panelists, uh, ask them to consider this. And I think the first point I'll make it was prompted by Fred's comments at the very end. Uh, I'm a lifelong professor, and even when I was in college administration, I continued to teach. And one of the things that I, I learned over my career is that if you wish to engage a student, or if a museum wishes to engage a viewer, then debate helps. Passive learning, I think, is the enemy of all educators. One reason why for giving lectures. Lectures may enjoy it. They like to hear themselves speak. They know the field. They have expertise. They provide the material. And you hope and you look out over the audience that if you say something truly profound or something slightly interesting, <laughs> you'll see some students go, yeah, a little light bulb. But I'll say that for the most part, I enjoy seminars. Smaller groups of students, and I knew that there would be give and take. And the issues we were discussing would invariably, invariably be contentious in some way. And that, I think, is befitting in a democracy. So this topic, museums uh, and the world, whose story is it, prompts me to ask our panelists, museum experts, how we can use a museum in order to engage the public in thinking rather than simply viewing, getting rid of the passivity and instead encourage active learning. And I, I, I thought at the very outset in seeing the dramatic uh, uh, picture of Washington, and it's romantic, I couldn't help but think, yes, the revolution created this country, it's great, Washington was a fine leader and the like, but as one who did a postdoc in Nova Scotia, I know a lot of Canadians who once upon a time were Americans and fled to Canada because they made the mistake of supporting the wrong side, the losing side. And we have a kind of victor's justice implicit in the way we romanticize Washington, Jefferson, other great leaders in American history. We tend to be altogether too damn provincial, in my point of view. So how can we, for example, use that Washington by inviting uh, Canadians, victims, if, if you will, uh, of, of, the, of the great march northward, to provide art that depicts their suffering as a result of the American Revolution? And that's just one example. I enjoyed a museum in Hanoi not long ago. And I was shocked as an American to see the way in which they, as provincial as us, depict the great glory of the War of Liberation against the bloody Americans. I think that's a story that they are, they should be telling their own people. But there is a propagandistic element, and I would argue that there are propagandistic elements in our own art, our own natural history museums, and we need to be critical thinkers and come to grips with how we root that out, or if we can't, simply say, this is what it is, but let's have another voice. Let's have the story with competing arguments, or as Fred pointed out, competing perspectives in the same place at the same time, so that the viewer or the museum goer has to stop, pause, and think about the consequences or the meaning, historical or otherwise, of particular pictures. Tolstoy once said, history would be a wonderful thing if only it were true. <laughs> well, there's something to be said about that. We tell histories or we tell stories based on our own particular, oftentimes narrow perspective. So the key is, it seems to me, is to try Knowing up front, we'll never get the complete picture, but let's try to expand it as much as we can in a dynamic way that engages people. That's one point. When we say, who is telling the story, I would ask also, are they telling the whole story? Uh, 
is the museum in some way, quite apart from lack of resources, self-censoring? Are there certain pieces in their collection that they're not sharing because no one's written a little cute little label in 25 or 30 words explaining the meaning of this? I think that's a fair question to ask. When we recently read, alluded to earlier, the Smithsonian recently exercised censorship against a brief video about gays and lesbians because right-wingers didn't like it, congressional people, and said, well, pull your funding. At the same time, yesterday I read that over at the United Arab Emirates, which is hosting this wonderful art show, they're censoring uh, a film for much the same reason, because it was critical of the emir. Well, I think the United States and all museums should make a very strong statement that internationally, we refuse across the board ever to engage in censorship. Otherwise, how do we, how do we hold on to the high ground in dealing with friends in the Middle East who are trying to explore democracy and the like? How do we, how do we enjoy the high ground? We need to say that museums, whatever sort, are sanctuaries. They should be free from interference. And all museum leaders, in my judgment, and I'll stop here, <laughs> should never lose an opportunity to make that statement. Yeah, the new mayor of Chicago once said, the crisis is a terrible thing to waste. If we have such a crisis in our museums, let's not waste it. And those of you who support museums and education more broadly, I think are honor bound to stand up on behalf of museums and say, leave our sanctuaries alone.